Everybody, welcome to the Right About Now podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Small. It is so great to have you join me today. We've got a really interesting show. I swear you will learn something on this episode. I know I did. My guest is Kerry Mayer, who is a leading author in the historical fiction genre. And Kerry just released a new book called The Girl in the White Gloves that explores the life of the actress-turned-princess Grace Kelly. Now, Kerry has a really interesting origin story about how she went through quite a few rejected novels, including a mystery book and a romance novel, until she finally found her calling in the historical novel genre. First, with a book called The Kennedy Debutante, which is about Kathleen Kick Kennedy. And now she has her new book on Grace Kelly. And before Carrie became a full-time writer, she was a teacher. And she even wrote a non-fiction book called This Is Not a Writing Manual, Notes for a Young Writer. And of course, hearing that, I just had to grill her about all sorts of information about being a writer. I even asked her how one knows if writing is the right profession for them. One sign is, do you get cranky when you're not doing it? (sighs) Almost every writer I know has this moment in their life when they realize that they've been really in a bad mood. (laughs) And they realize that it's because they haven't done any creative work for whatever the amount of time is. You know, and it's different for everyone. For some people, it's two weeks. For some others, it's two years. And it's only by getting back to the writing or whatever the creative work is that you feel complete again. Okay, so we're going to get right to my conversation with Carrie Mayer. But first, how about a little primer on Grace Kelly? Because I didn't know a whole lot about her before I read this book and did the podcast. So here's the deal. Before there was Meghan Markle, there was another Hollywood starlet turned princess named Grace Kelly. But it's hard to express just how big a star Grace Kelly was back in her day. Seemingly overnight, she became the film favorite of America's 50 million moviegoers. And in March 1955, Grace Kelly received Hollywood's highest honor, the coveted Oscar for her sensitive performance in The Country Girl. On a star-studded night, her brilliance shone brightest of all. At the Audience Awards presentation in December, she stood at the pinnacle of her screen career. Grace Kelly had found success, but not true love. She was born in a prominent Philadelphia family, and she went on to become a big-time stage actress and eventually made it onto the silver screen during Hollywood's golden age. She starred famously in a series of Alfred Hitchcock classics, Rear Window and To Catch a Thief. But when Grace Kelly was 25 years old, she gave it all up, her acting career, the Hollywood life, to marry Prince Rainier of Monaco and become a full-time princess. She never acted again. After all the fever of publicity, the acres of newsprint, the fashion notes, and the jewel robberies, the great day approaches at last when Grace Kelly of Philadelphia, USA, will become the bride of Rainier, Prince of Monaco. Wedding gifts have come from all over the world. Gifts in gold and silver, jewelry and fine porcelain. Presents from kings and queens, presidents and commoners, movie magnets and millionaires. A pile of riches which look as though Aladdin had rubbed his lamp to furnish this fairy tale wedding. And Kelly At the remained a princess until 1982 when she died tragically in a car accident after suffering from a stroke while she was driving. Princess Grace of Monaco. Grace Kelly died today in Monte Carlo of injuries suffered in a fiery car crash yesterday. She was 52 years old. Palace spokesman said the princess. So that just gives you a little download on Grace Kelly, in case you didn't know much about her. But I'll let Kerry Mayer tell you lots more about 
the challenges and the opportunities in writing historical fiction. So without further delay, I bring you my conversation with Kerry Mayer. Kerry Mayer, welcome to Write About Now. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm fascinated to get into a little bit of your backstory and the story behind this book, The Girl in White Gloves, which is a great read. So tell me a little bit about how you got into writing. When did you first discover that you enjoyed writing and this might be something you want to do for a living? Well, I wrote my first unfinished novel in fifth grade. (laughs) <laughs> so a long time ago, yeah. I wrote my second unfinished novel in middle school. <laughs> um, and actually, there's a funny story. Um, and then I was an English major in college and, and, and everything. Um, for a while there, I was, I was an art history minor in college. And I loved the idea of working in museums. And I, I got myself an internship in New York, which is how, how I moved from California uh, to the East Coast originally. And I was like determined to work in museums. But my parents have always told the story. Yeah, Carrie thought she was moving to New York to work in museums. We knew she was moving to New York to become a writer. <laughs> <laughs> what were your no- early novels about? Do you even Do you still have them? Well, the fifth grade one, I actually do remember. So my fifth grade one was about a girl and her relationship with someone who was blind. And I have no idea what the, I have no recollection of what the, um, what the inspiration for that was. <laughs> and my middle school one was about two teenage runaways. <laughs> wow. That's pretty, that's pretty intense. Yeah. Lots of drama. <laughs> well, you have a leg up on my kids. They got to They got to get their novels written. God. Um, I got to get them on that. Okay, so you moved to New York and you are thinking that you want to work in museums. Your parents have other (laughs) designs for you. When did you decide, well, maybe museums is not really what I'm into. I'm more into writing. Really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, the the internship, as wonderful it was in many ways, was showed me that that was not my scene. And I wound up sharing a one bedroom apartment in Brooklyn, working at the local independent bookstore, and also as a nanny. Oh, wow. <laughs> and actually writing my first completed novel. So you're working there and tell me what happens next. Um, So I wrote that novel and I I actually I finished it. And, you know, that was sort of what we might call my apprentice novel, you know, and one of the great things about working at the community bookstore was like it was like a mini MFA. Everyone else who worked there was an aspiring writer of some sort. And so we would all during our shifts when we weren't helping customers, we would be shelving books and talking about our writing and, and the books we were reading and talking about them like writers talk about about books. And, you know, I I tried to find an agent for that book. I was not successful. Um, But I did make some interesting connections that actually have lasted quite a long time for me. Uh, I got tired of being poor. (laughs) Yeah, it's not fun. So I especially in New York, it's not fun to be poor in New York. It is no, it no, it is not. Mm -hmm. Um, Joan Didion has this great quote in one of her essays that New York is a city for the very young and the very rich. So true. So I was I was very young. So I got to enjoy it on that level. Um, So I wound up um, being like, you know, I'm not getting any traction with this novel. I'm going to go get a real job. So I wound up managing um, a store in Grand Central Station for the better part of a year. At the end of which I woke up one morning and I was like, I have to go to school. I have to go back to school. (laughs) Yeah. So I like in short order, I, um, I got an application ready for a bunch of MFA programs and I serendipitously got into Columbia. So I didn't even have to move. That's great. Um, Yeah. So I basically stayed living in Brooklyn and I would commute up. I used the subway to commute up to Columbia. And while I was at Columbia, I also got some teaching experience, which was really terrific. And while I was at school, I mainly worked on short stories. I didn't write another novel then. Um, Why was that? Well, I just found that the workshop format was really hard for novels. And I I think I was also, I was too young and inexperienced experience to figure out how to make it work for me for a novel. I just found it was easier to write a short story and submit it to the workshop fully formed. Mm -hmm. And and then people could discuss the full 15 pages or whatever that I had fit in rather than like handing them the middle of a novel and having them go, but I don't know what happened before. (laughs) So a lot of insider baseball. So I got my (laughs) MFA and I got my teaching experience. And then I started 
I got a full-time teaching gig at a university in New Jersey. And so I spent the next six years teaching and writing, which was really, I found teaching writing and also writing, doing my own writing to be a wonderful, have a wonderful synergy. And I also, I fell in with a group of other teacher writers who were doing a lot of the same kind of thing as me. So again, kind of like the community bookstore days, I was always thinking about writing and, and words and how to do it better. And it was a period of real growth for me and I, it was terrific. And you're just around all these other writers that must be very, uh, you know, nurturing and it's a good environment to be around. Yes. And at the same time, I was sort of, I, you know, so as soon as I was finished with my MFA, I did uh, write another novel. I actually wrote, it was a mystery novel. (laughs) And that was the novel that got me my first agent. It did not sell, but I had an agent, which was great news. Yeah. You know, I also actually, during my MFA years, I did actually write a novel during my MFA years. I sublet my Brooklyn apartment one summer and went to California and lived with my parents and wrote a romance novel. (laughs) Wow. So you really tried, you tried your hand at a lot of different genres. I did. I did. And it's, it's shocking to me now to... Um, wonder why I didn't find historical fiction earlier than I did because mm-hmm. I've always loved history. Yeah. But I came to it later. But all my other experiences and other genres for sure informed and shaped my ability to write historical fiction w- once I got there. Now, were you writing what you just felt like writing or were you sort of looking at the market and saying, hmm, I should write some romance novels or hmm, I should maybe mystery is a good thing to sell? Or was it was it about kind of what you were feeling at the time? It was really about what I was feeling at the time. Right. Uh, you know, the, the romance novel one was a little bit of a rebellion. <laughs> um, I was in the middle of my MFA program and, you know, it was a, it was a great program and I got a tremendous amount out of it. But there was a part of me that was like, I just want to do something fun. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't want to have to read, you know, depressing novels all the time about the world. I, I want to read something life, light and life affirming. So I did. And I learned, you know, a tremendous amount. I had, you know, I was not a reader of romance novels, not for any particular reason. But so I thought to myself, well, it might be fun to write a romance novel. So I read a bunch of them. Yeah, that, that's how you prepped. So, much. so you prep you. So yeah, I was going to ask how you how you taught yourself how to write a romance novel. It's really, you didn't buy a book on how to write no romance novels. No. You just you just read a bunch of romance novels. I just read a bunch of romance novels. And I, you know, even the most formulaic of them, and they're less less formulaic than people, I think, realize, taught me very, very interesting lessons about pacing and plot and character development um, that I really, those were lessons I really would not have picked up elsewhere. So why do you think those didn't sell? Because then you would go on to be, you know, a best-selling author. But tell me why, What in the early days, what do you think you were doing wrong? They probably weren't as good. <laughs> All right, we won't tell anybody that. <laughs> well, you were learning. Yeah, I was. That's exactly right. I was learning. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know what to say. Like, you know, the romance novel. I probably only wrote one, and I did like a partial revision of that. That wasn't a book that I worked worked on for a long period of time. Um, you know, my very first novel really was a true apprentice novel. I was learning to write a novel as I wrote it. Mm-hmm. Now, were you teaching yourself, or were you taking like a workshop? Did you have a teacher? I know you. Were- I just did it myself. Yeah. Okay. Just I did eventually fall in with a writing group that was formed from friends I had made at the bookstore, but that right. was it. Now it's interesting. So, but you kept on going. Was there ever a moment in in your in your mind that you were like, maybe writing isn't my thing? Like maybe this is not because you you know a lot of rejection in the early stage of your career. A lot of rejection, but I had just enough validation to kind of keep me going. You know, I got mm-hmm. into an MFA program. I yeah. got into um, the Squaw Valley Writers Conference. I got an agent. And the, each of those sort of validating events sort of happened with enough, just when I needed it <laughs> to yeah. happen. Yeah. And, you know, there were times when I took breaks too. You know, there was a point when, God, I think my third novel hadn't sold. And, you know, I had I had an agent, you know, who would, was trying to sell it and it didn't sell when I was like, you know, I need a break. And that was actually um, when I founded my literary journal, Yarn, the Young Adult Review Network. Mm. And I kind of put on my editing hat, which was great. 
and I, I got to mentor young writers and I got to uh, kind of be on the yes side of publishing. Yes, I want to publish this. Yeah, <laughs> and that did. was great for me. You know, that, it, that, that reinforced my love of writing in words. I think no one should get into writing unless it's their one true love. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Because for most of us, it takes a long time. Uh, yeah, it does. And it takes a lot of patience. I mean, when you would w embark on a novel, how long would the process be from, you know, the idea to the actual submitting it to your agent? You know, that's a tough one because it's really different for every book. You know, I yeah. worked on my very, that very first apprentice novel for like two or three years before kind of deciding it was fatally flawed and I needed to move on. The Kennedy debutante, my first historical novel that, that did get published and it was my big breakthrough. I worked on that for three years of research and writing and rewriting before it sold. The Grace Kelly novel, which I wrote under contract, it was my first time writing a novel under contract, mm. took about two years. Okay. That's a lot so of research, the, too. Yeah. Things speed up a lot once you have a contract. But it's your, <laughs> that's what it's your job. Yeah. You don't have all the time in the world. Right. Yeah. It helps to have... I, writers need deadlines and, and constraints, and, and, and you know, it help, it's, it's, it's very tough to do it on your own. I always tell people just make artificial deadlines, right? I mean, it's yes. just... Yeah, give yourself well, some sort of deadline. Yeah, and being part of a writing group where you're beholden to, where you actually have to turn in some pages to the group and get some feedback, that's a great way way of forcing yourself to have a deadline. Yeah. You, it's interesting. So you, uh, you had said that, you know, you really shouldn't embark on writing unless it really is your one true passion. And I think a lot of writers might, or aspiring writers might ask, well, how do I know this is my passion? Like, how do I know this is the thing I should do? Like, I like to do a lot of different things. How do I know writing is the thing? One sign is, do you get cranky when you're not doing it? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Almost every writer I know has this moment in their life when they realize that they've been really in a bad mood. <laughs> yeah. And they realize that it's because they haven't done any creative work for whatever the amount of time is, you know, and it's different for everyone. For some people, it's two weeks. For some pe others, it's two years. And it's only by getting back to the writing or whatever the creative work is that you feel complete again, you know, right. um, some writers will say, I don't like writing. I like having written. I've heard that quote before. Maybe. Yeah. 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 There's that. There's that. There's definitely that. I mean, there are lots of writers who feel compelled to do it, but don't love like it. love the process or, yeah. you know, feel like the process, you know, like Hemingway, Oh, writing, it's easy. You just sit at the typewriter and bleed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not so dramatic about it. I actually really enjoy the process, even on my hardest days when I don't feel inspired. I mean, most days I don't feel inspired. I, I, I'm like, I'm sitting down at the computer and I'm laying track, but that's, but that is part of being a writer is making yourself do it when you don't feel like it. Why do you it's think you like it? Why do you think you like it so much? Well, <laughs> I love imagining. I like I like imagining things in my own head. I, that yeah. sounds really strange, but I just I really enjoy that. Yeah, and it's interesting because you so you never chose to be a nonfiction writer, although you and we're going to get into this. You you are sort of border into the nonfiction world because you're dealing with actual <laughs> real people in your novels sure. and events. Yeah. But you but you always chose um, fiction as your medium, even in all the different genres that you tried, it was always fiction. It was never. Well, I do actually have one book of nonfiction out there. It's uh, under a different name, Carrie Majors. Uh -huh. I wrote um, uh, an advice driven memoir for, for young people who want to be writers. It's called um, This Is Not a Writing Manual and Writers Digest Books published it back in 2003. You can still you can still get it. Oh, that's so amazing. I do. I do. I have written nonfiction. I, not as much. Um, I love nonfiction. Um, I love reading it. Um, I think memoir, I love the genre of memoir, yeah. but you're, you're right. I keep, keep coming back to fiction. Fiction is what I always, where my heart always was. So let's talk about this transition or this discovery of historical fiction as a genre that you uh, would then find success in. Um, how did you come across, how did this opportunity arise for you? 
Well, so I was always aware of historical fiction. And one of the one of the, the reads that really changed the way I saw the genre was Paula McLean's novel, The Paris Wife, about Hadley Richardson, Ernest Hemingway's first wife. Mm. I read that as, what, when I was in a book club and I just absolutely loved it. And I right. thought, wow, <laughs> this is so fun. This would be really cool to do. But I didn't like have a su- subject in mind or anything. I just sort of filed it away under good to know. <laughs> so what, what, why, why did it resonate with you so much, do you think? Well, it was just, I mean, I, I love the twenties. So, and I, and I, I love that, that sort of group of people and that time. And she just did such a, a an amazing job of evoking the people and the place. And I yeah. could smell it. And I really felt just totally sucked into Hadley's story. And I was also intrigued by this idea of writing about a real person mm-hmm. in a fictional manner. I, I, yeah, that's interesting. I'm not sure if I had writ- read very many other books like that. I mean, now it's a, it's, mm-hmm. it's a, hu- a hugely popular sh- subgenre of historical fiction, which I myself am writing in. Yeah. But it, when I read the novel, I, it, it felt new and fresh to me. Right. So fast forward a few years, it's the height of the Downton Abbey uh, frenzy. Did you did you watch Downton Abbey? I did. I watched every season. I love Downton too. Abbey, except for the movie. Um, I did not see the movie. I will. I have continue. not seen that yet. <laughs> I will. So you know, at the height of the the craziness, um, there you know, uh, you know, all the local um, public uh, television channels were throwing as, as many other shows related to Downton Abbey at it as, as they could. Yeah. And one of them that I watched was um, an English documentary series about the great manor houses of England, mm-hmm. and the the marquee estate of the series was Highclere Castle, where Downton Abbey was filmed. But they also spent a whole episode, an hour on Chatsworth House, which has long been the seat of the Dukes of Devonshire. And they did the whole 400 year history of the house. But for a few minutes of that hour, they talked about how John F. Kennedy's younger sister, favorite younger sister, Kick, mm-hmm. stood to inherit the house if she had become the, the, uh, the, the future Duchess of Devonshire because she was in love with the future Duke. Um, a young man named Billy Hardington, but that their romance was opposed by both of their families because she was a Catholic and he was <gasps> a Protestant. Mm. And I Scandalous. just thought, wow, there's a story there. Yeah, <laughs> conflict and yeah, an yeah. intrigue and an interesting. And, you know, it's people. on the eve of World War II. And I just, the next day I fell down a total ra- Google rabbit hole about her and her story. And I, I immediately saw that there could be a Paris wife-like book written about her. But it took me a while to actually commit to writing it. <laughs> Why is that? Well, at the, actually, when I the, 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 when I watched the show, I was under contract to write the This Is Not a Writing Manual. So I literally had to write another book. Mm-hmm. And also, for a while, I was like, who am I to write about the Kennedys? Right. Like, I'm just some housewife with five unpublished novels in her attic. Like, so I had to kind of get over myself a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But but the novel just kept calling out to me, and when I when I finally mentioned it to my agent at the time, she was like, "Oh, that is the book you need to write. You need to write that book, <laughs> right? And you should do what your agent tells you to do." Yeah, and also what your passion tells you to do. Like it was it yes. was calling out to you, right? Yes. Even though yes. even though you had doubts, and it's always going to creep in. I should. Yeah. What am I doing writing a Kennedy book? I don't I don't know anything about the Kennedy. Yeah. So yeah. she's such an interesting historical figure. And, and can you just tell us a little bit of a, a, a really brief stroke about Kathleen? I mean, I know you wrote a whole book about her, but Kathleen Kick Kennedy. This is not the same Kathleen Kennedy that that runs uh, Lucas Films. This is, no. this is an unknown. No. <laughs> this um, is- although there is a young Kathleen Kick Kennedy walking around in the world today. She is um, RFK Jr.'s daughter, and wow. she is very much named for her great aunt. Oh, how cool. Who's the subject of my novel. Um, and, well, let's see. Um, <laughs> when I was writing about her, um, everyone would be like, is she the one who had the lobotomy? <laughs> Uh-huh. And I was like, no, that's her older sister, Rosemary. So Kick was the fourth of the nine children. It went Joe Jr., Jack, Rosemary, Kick. And then there were the five that were younger than the, the, the four of them. And one of the things that I discovered in my research was sort of, so the, the four oldest ones were sort of always regarded as the four older Kennedys. And they were often together, mm-hmm. like Kick, 
partied with her two older brothers quite a lot. Um, and she and Jack really did have a very special relationship. I mean, I in, in the research that I did, the people that remembered them from this period of t uh, time, the late 30s, they just had said the two of them together at a party was like watching a screwball comedy. Yeah. They were both super quick, super witty, super fun, and everyone wanted to be around them. They just lit up a room. So that was exciting to see. And, you know, she, she went over to England when her father was appointed ambassador to England in mm -hmm. 1938. And she was a debutante. And she was the it girl of the season. As the ambassador's daughter, 18-year-old Kathleen, better known as Kick, is introduced to the highest levels of British society. Her mother, Rose, formally presents Kick and her sister at the court of King George VI and Queen Elizabeth. The media declare Kick to be the most exciting debutante of the year. Really against the odds. This is England, you know, you know, notoriously closed <laughs> to outsiders. Yeah. But they, the whole family was really embraced by um, English society. And she, and in no small part, I think, because Kick was so friendly and outgoing and easy to be around. And she was really like the most popular debutante on the circuit. Mm, spoiler alert. She doesn't live a very long life. She did not live a very long life. I think that's one of the reasons why she gets confused with Rosemary. Uh -huh. She's, you know, she's really like the forgotten Kennedy. Yeah. Well, that, well you found her. So I did. <clears throat> Lucky me. I could <laughs> not believe, by the way, that nothing had been written about her in almost in more than 30 years. That's amazing. But well, while, while I was writing my novel, two biographies of her came out. <laughs> oh, God. So stressful. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I mean, it didn't impact. I mean, I think, you know, as somebody said to me, interest means there's interest. So I think right. it, sounds, it was good. And you weren't writing, you um, weren't writing a biography. You were writing a historical fiction, which is very, which is different. It is different. Yeah. So you write that book. And um, when you handed that in, you know, you didn't know if they would, if anybody would buy it, right? You'd had some, no. in the past, you'd had some bad luck. But this one was different. Did you feel it right away that this is this one might really sell? I certainly hoped that that would be the case. But you know, hope is a is a is a tough thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it can set you up for a lot of disappointment. Yeah. So I was cautiously hopeful. I certainly felt like, gosh, if there's any subject that's going to be that's going to sell, it's this one. And I just hoped that my own skills were up to the task. And after, like I said, those five unpublished novels and starting my writing career at the ripe old age of fifth grade, you know, 10 years old in fifth grade, yeah. this novel sold really fast. I, I, I had, for a variety of different reasons, I had to find a new agent, which, and that went pretty quickly. And then my agent sold the book quite, quite so quickly. So maybe it was your agent <laughs> the whole time maybe. it was your yeah. Well, I, I actually don't think it was that. I think, <laughs> you know, I, I could go back through the, all the other novels and, and tell you why I think they sold or didn't sell. But, yeah. you know, who really knows? Yeah, no. But I'm um, so, so it's amazing that it sold and it really set your career on a whole different track at that point. Yes. And I'm, I'm so grateful that that is the case. Now, were you still teaching when the book sold? Were you still in that life? No, I was not still teaching. So um, at that point, I had not been teaching for four years. We, um, uh, my, my husband at the time uh, uh, had gotten a, a job in Massachusetts. So, and it happened to coincide with my getting pregnant with our, our first and only child. So right. when we moved up to Massachusetts, I ran yarn and I was still writing, and I, I obviously wrote this not a writing manual, but I was, you know, mostly a stay-at-home parent. Right. So after that, did you sort of, you and your agent immediately decide, okay, this was a success for us. We need to replicate you staying in this particular genre and kind of capture the momentum here. Is that kind of how it, it shifted for you? Yeah, well, so there's that and the fact that quite luxuriously, I got a two book contract. Nice. Um, so they when they when when Berkeley purchased the Kennedy debutante, they also p purchased my as yet unwritten next novel of historical fiction. So I knew I would be writing another 
historical novel kind of like The Kennedy Debutante. And I knew that was what was next for me. Did you ever, while you were working on The Kennedy Debutante, have ideas for working on other historical fiction? Like were people coming, popping into your radar and saying, wow, that would be a really good site. That would be a good story. You know, I wish I could say yes to that (laughs) because I feel like that is true for many, many writers, but I was just, I was so laser focused on kick and her story for so long. I almost, it was almost like I was in the, in a tunnel or had blinders on or whatever metaphor you want to use. And it wasn't until I kind of emerged from it and I knew that she was, it was going to get published that I started thinking about other topics. And I and, and Grace Kelly emerged quite quickly at that point. So let's talk about Grace Kelly. But at first, before we get into the Grace Kelly, I want to ask you a question about the nature of historical fiction in general. Mm-hmm. What are what are sort of the legality around writing about true people, but fictionalizing some? Are they considered sort of public domain because they're public figures or like how, how does that all work? Yes. Well, uh, well, I want to put in the caveat. I am not a lawyer. And I not <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but but obviously um, somebody vetted it. So it was fine yeah, that what you did. Exactly. I mean, listen, um, this is something that's being done all the time both on television. You know, we look at the crown. Um, yeah. I think you, uh, personally, I think you have to be really brave to be um, uh, work, uh, doing historical fiction about people who are still alive. Yeah. Um, because there, there actually are different um, rules that apply, legal rules that apply to people who are alive. Oh, that's interesting. Who are dead. Yeah. Um, there are also different rules that apply to, as you said, public figures. Yeah. That's about as much as I can say. No, 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 but that's so, but it's interesting. So, so you, did you have any constraints on you when, um, when you, when you're working on these books now, both Grace Kelly and Kick Kennedy are no longer with us. So maybe the rules were different, but did anybody ever say to you, a lawyer from the, you know, from the publishing company, uh, as long as you don't do this, you know, like you're, you're going to be fine. I mean, you, well, you know, yeah. those are conversations that historical novelists have amongst ourselves all the time. Right. And, you know, whenever, you know, whenever, you know, publishing houses do have in-house legal teams so that if you have a question like that, you can ask and you should. But, you know, I'm also very fortunate that I have fallen into this group of amazing uh, writers who are doing the same thing that I'm doing. And so we talk all the time about, the kinds of representations that make us nervous or what we feel like maybe we should use or not use. And so there's, there's a constant tension there. And we're always making decisions, I think, about what's, what's right for the novel and what's not right for the novel. Right. So let's talk about Grace Kelly. Um, okay. I, didn't, I honestly did not know a lot about Grace Kelly before I read your book and took a little deep dive into her. I, it's sort of not my generation. It's my mom's generation. My mom... Uh, when I told her I was doing this interview, was very excited because she's like, "Oh, I, I, she was the one I loved." You know, Grace Kelly was really the one that I always really loved, love, love when I was growing up, um, and and could relate to. But how did Grace Kelly come into your radar? How did you find out about her? The same way, <laughs> <laughs> my mom, who you know was born in the late forties, she was a big Alfred Hitchcock fan. Right. Um, and so, and two of her favorites were Rear Window and and um, and To Catch a Thief, which starred Grace Kelly, both of them. And so I was introduced to those movies at a very young age, you know, even though I was growing up in the 80s. If you really want to see fireworks, it's better with the lights out. I have a feeling that tonight you're going to see one of the Riviera's most fascinating sights. I was talking about the fireworks. I never doubted it. Well, you looked at my necklace, I didn't know. I've been dying to say something about it all evening. Go ahead. Why, about me staring at it? No, you've been trying to avoid it. May I have a brandy? Please. Would you care for one? No, thank you. Some nights a person doesn't need to drink. So Grace Kelly was on my radar uh, from my earliest memory of like watching movies. Um, and so when, after, you know, the Kennedy debutante, I was finished and I was sort of looking around for another subject. Grace Kelly, I, I, re, I, my, I, my eyes landed on her very quickly. Um, you know, I, I had some sense that she had made these movies in the fifties, but not later. And yeah. so 
that presented an immediate question to me, like, well, why didn't she make more movies? Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew that she was an American woman who had married a prince in Europe. And I thought, well, what was that like? Yeah. Um, what went into that decision? And so at some point, you know, my novelist brain kicks in and I think, ah, these are interesting questions. Could they support a book? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, you know, the more I learned about her, the more interesting she became. She just, it, uh, there was, it was just, she was fascinating. Now, this was before the Meghan Markle, um, Prince Harry uh, courtship and marriage? <sighs> you know, it's sort of amazing that I might not remember this. Um, <laughs> yes, I was a little bit before that. So this is very much a, an ish, a topic that is very relevant today, and you kind of, in some ways, just a, a happy coincidence that you were able that you discovered this story and decided to write about it right when this was also happening with with Harry and and um, Meghan Markle. Yes, the timing um, from like a you know a promotional standpoint, if you will, couldn't yeah. have been better. But it wasn't. It certainly was not designed. It's that not way. designed that way. Before you made this decision to write about Grace Kelly, did you do some research? on just other people that had written about her to make sure there was no other historical fiction story about Grace Kelly. Yes, yes. That's, I mean, whenever you come up with any, with any subject, well, one of the first things you do is you go to Amazon and you're like, hey, who else has written about her? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, because you, I mean, because, and sometimes you discover that, that, they, that there's already a novel and, you, you know, you, you don't feel like you can do better or differently, you know, you have nothing to add. Um, so that happens all the time. It, um, but, it, you know, in the case of Grace Kelly, it was kind of incredible. Like, um, there were obviously many biographies, and I yeah. read quite a number of them, um, but no novels. Yeah, that's interesting. Is is historical fiction a relatively new genre? I mean, or has it been around forever? No, I mean it's been around. It's okay. been around for you know a very long time. Okay, um, but I, I would say that this. Um, <sighs> There has definitely, I would say, like maybe since the Paris wife and, you know, that which also came out around the same time as the aviator's wife about Anne Morrow Lindbergh. Um, I, I sort of think of these those novels as being like almost the starting point of this this, this recent batch of historical fiction that is um, um, intent on kind of br- bringing to light these the lives of forgotten figures or less known public figures like Anne Morrow Lindbergh is a good example. You know, she was married to um, the famous aviator Mm -hmm. and and Hadley Richardson, who was married to uh, Ernest Hemingway, Kit Kennedy, who was the the younger sister of uh, John F. Kennedy, um, but it has been essentially forgotten. So, uh, now, Grace Kelly hasn't that. been forgotten, right? So she's she's different than Kit Kennedy because she's very much an icon of, of American cinema yes. and American sort of pop culture. But it's interesting you were drawn to her because in some ways there is some similarity, similarities to Kathleen Kennedy. I mean, they're both, both women, both yep. born into privilege and had these kind of larger than life kind of, if there can be an American aristocracy, they were part of it, and then of course she joined. Grace Kelly became an, ar- an aristocrat. But yes. but um, is, do you think you're just? Is it again a coincidence, or do you think you are drawn to these these kinds of stories and these kinds of? Uh, I, no, it's definitely a coincidence. And in fact, you know, the the Kelly family was sometimes referred to as the Kennedys of Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Um, they weren't nearly as stratospherically successful and wealthy as the Kennedys, but. They, they did very, very well. Right. Her father did very, very well. No. And in fact, my the, the novel that I'm working on now is about a totally different kind of person. <laughs> is it a <laughs> secret? Totally you can't tell us. Time. No, it's not a secret. It's a it's um it's about it's it's set in Paris in the nineteen twenties, so glamorous in a very different kind of way. And it's about uh Sylvia Beach, the American woman who opened the original Shakespeare and Company bookstore in Paris in nineteen nineteen, wow. which became the home of the lost generation writers. We I've, I've referred to them many times, you know, um you know, Ernest Hemingway and everybody. Yeah. I love this period of time. So it's such an exciting privilege to get to write a novel set during the time. But the other thing Sylvia Beach did that I think many people don't know that she did, um, if they know who she is, um, is she published the very first edition of James Joyce's novel Ulysses in 1922 after it had been banned and convicted of obscenity in 1921 in New York. So it's a bookish novel. No, no royalty. 
<laughs> yeah, no royalty in this one. Okay, little literary royalty, but, still, but not actual. Royalty. But Europe, there's some Europe in there, and there's definitely that yes. that period of time. Um, yes. Uh, so once take me a little bit through the process. Once you decide it's going to be Grace Kelly, uh, I imagine you you tell your agent, you tell the publishing company. Were they on board right away? They were. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They, and, you know, they do some of the same um, homework that I do to make sure that there's nothing else out there and that, you know, it, uh, and give it the green light. Right. So what's interesting in, in just researching for this book, tell me a little bit about the process because I was intrigued about how you did it. She didn't keep a diary. She didn't nope. or they didn't find a diary. She might have kept one. You know, there's no love letters that you can go through. And yet you have love letters in the book. So how did you research it and sort of get into the the world that she inhabited? Well, I, as I think I said earlier, I read a number of biographies. Yes. Um, and, you know, you sort of start to see what, you know, the patterns and when, when to the extent to which we can talk about the truth, you see where some of the truths are. And I did manage to get a hold of a few letters and things in her own hand at the Margaret Herrick Library out in California. Um, it's the library of the Mo- Motion Picture Arts and mm-hmm. Sciences who give out the Oscars. Oh, cool. Um, so I was able to read a few letters that she exchanged with like Cary Grant and Edith Head, which were really fascinating and revealing. There weren't very many of them, though. Yeah. Um, but I also, um, whenever possible, I like to do on-site research. So, you know, I live outside of Boston now, so it wasn't hard for me to go down to Philadelphia. I went down to Philadelphia. I looked at her the, her family home, which was built by her father, who ran a construction company. Mm. Um, I went to their summer home in Ocean City, New Jersey, which is also built by her father. And I went to, because I because I traveled to see family out in California, I even walked around the Hollywood Hills and went to the Chateau Marmont. These are places I had been, those are places I had been before. Right. Um, but I actually drove by her up the apartment that she shared on Sweetser Avenue with Rita Gam. <laughs> oh my God. I, I live near um, Sweetser. That's funny. Was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I also, I, I did go to Monaco for a week. So I toured the palace and I, I just soaked up as much. As so I yeah. So when you're I soaking up, like, what are you doing? Are you taking notes and saying, you know, I got to reference this particular view or I've got, you know, like when you go into the Chateau Marmont, are you go into the, the the hills of Monaco, is it more just getting a feeling, like sort of imagining what it would be like to be her then? Yes. So I, I took a lot of pictures. And when I had kind of thoughts, I would jot them down. But, uh, you know, as a friend of mine advised me, another another writer friend of mine advised me, she was like, I want you to go to Monaco and just feel Monaco. And that was the right advice. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Because it it really is, you're just trying to sort of be, uh, inhabit the place a little bit. And, you know, one of the things that I did was, um, I happened to be there with my parents and my dad is an intrepid international driver. And so (laughs) we actually drove the road that she ultimately dies on. Yeah. But But it's also the road, just maybe more importantly in some ways, that connects Monaco to this little French town of La Turbie, mm-hmm. which is where they close uh, to where they actually lived most of the time. They had a house um, set into the hills um, outside of this uh, town, La Turbie. And uh, the, the French town was fascinating to me. It had this enormous 2000 year old Roman ruin in the, in the middle of the town. And I wound up setting a, an important scene in the novel there. And I never would have done that if I hadn't seen hadn't it. Hadn't seen it, yeah. You know, it just wouldn't have even occurred to me. See, this is when, if you're going to write historical fiction, just pick somebody who lived in all these really cool exotic places because then you have an excuse to visit them. Well, so far, <laughs> that is my nefarious plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to just go to Paris for, sorry. <laughs> all right, so... You, you made an interesting decision in telling the story where you tell it from two different periods of Grace Kelly's life, her early life and then her uh, later life sort of reflecting back, you know, but you tell it in the third person. But w- tell me how you, why you made that decision. Well, I knew that I wanted to write about her whole life from the point at which she leaves Philadelphia in 1947 to become, uh, to study at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. And I knew I wanted to write through the end. And I thought about uh, somehow or another doing it just purely chronologically didn't feel right to me. I, I wanted from the beginning for readers to have a sense for the tension between 
the woman she the young woman she was that she started out as and the older woman that she became and the only way to do that was this dual timeline that i that i wrote it as right um and it took some it took some fiddling and and when i revised it i i sort of i I moved the pieces around a little bit but um i think it was for me it was the most effective way to tell her story it's interesting in the author's note you you actually explain to the reader you know, the liberties that you took, the, you know, in terms of changing, making some changes, but they're not pretty, they're not very major changes that you made. You were pretty true to her story, right? I mean, tell me about how much sort of poetic license you feel you have. Again, this is, you know, I'm sure book by book, but what kind of poetic license do you have to sort of change some of the, the details in these kinds of, you know, I, th- this is this is so personal to the to the to the writer, and yeah. you know, in the case of I think I say this in the author's note, I, I took more liberties with Grace Kelly's life than I did with Kick's life, in part because I was covering such a, a long period of time, and you know, she had even though she was tra- she died tragically young, the life that she did leave was incredibly full and rich, rich yeah. in people and events. And so, for instance, I had to, I felt like I had to create some composite characters. I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't cover all of her childhood friends. I had to give her a childhood friend for the purposes of the novel, you know? So, and those are the things that I try to account for in the book. And I, you know, I would never dream of changing major dates, you know, like the the date of her wedding or, you know, the dates of her movie releases, you know, those are really important matters of public record that I would never dream of changing. But like, I really wanted her to have a conversation with her son that involved Star Wars and, (laughs) No, and yeah. like I couldn't do that. So I, I, I did a little date fudging there. <laughs> I think um, I think you'd be forgiven for that. That's not. So. I hope so. I, hope <laughs> I don't so. think that's. So no, those are the places where you know at least I feel comfortable taking some some license with with the with the actual public record. But you know the truth is, you know history is 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 a series of of accounts. You know, and no two people remember the same event the same. Way. Right. So th- that gives any novelist a lot of room to kind of imagine the way something would have unfolded. When you're writing a book like this, do you imagine that you're that you know Grace Kelly, that you're you're friends with her, that you've met her, or is she always something diff- like a part, like a historical figure, or do you actually imagine like would she have liked it the way I wrote this? Like, do you ever think, wow, if Grace Kelly were were reading this, would she agree with what I said here? Did I get it right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's a terrifying question. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's, I just know that I would, as a neurotic Jew, I'm sure the whole time I'd be like, would she, would she have liked this? You know, <laughs> <laughs> there's a whole, certainly a whole Woody Allen movie. In exactly. That exactly. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I try not to do that. Yeah. Like, you know, the epigraph of the book, um, which I'll just, uh, there's two epigraphs. Oh, I love them, those. Yeah. I, I'll just read it. Yeah. Fairy tales. This is something, something the grace actually said later in her life fairy tales tell imaginary stories me i'm a living person i exist Mm. if the story of my life is a real woman were to be told one day people would at last discover the real being that i am and i i sort of took that as a kind of dare yeah she's asking (laughs) Um, you to to do what you did she's like somebody's got to tell the real story Yeah, yeah but you know as as i think um any reader coming to any, we'll call it a biographical novel, it is an interpretation of her life. It is my interpretation of her life. It is not, it is not a memoir. It's my interpretation of how her life unfolded. Hilary Mantel, who wrote the, um, the Wolf Hall uh, novels about um, Henry VIII, um, I was reading um, a lecture series that she gave and she put it really beautifully. She said, you know, historical fiction is not an exact replica. It's not a photographic representation. It's more like a painting with the brush strokes left in. Hmm. And I just thought that that was yeah, that's beautiful. beautiful and I couldn't have said it better. Right. How about the dialogue? I, you know, I've in my life thought about writing historical fiction and I love reading it and I love reading books about real people. And I'm, I'm very drawn to that era. And I was a history major in college, et cetera. Um, sometimes I find that I, I get intimidated by like, how would I, 
how would I write the way people talked in a, in a different time, right? And I think you do it well. And I'm wondering how you kind of got, did you watch a lot of old movies? Like, how'd you kind of get into the, the way they, they spoke at that time? So one of the first pieces of research, we'll call it, that I did was to sit down and watch all of her movies, to rewatch the right. ones I had already yeah. seen and watch anew the ones that I'd never watched. So c- certainly then that mid set sort of mid-century dialogue kind of got in my ear. Um, I also, you know, I was interested in the question of like, like, what was a Grace Kelly movie and how was it different from a Elizabeth Taylor movie or an Audrey Hepburn movie? So I watched some of those too. So I think that helped. Um, I also just love writing dialogue. It's my, it's some of my favorite parts of any book to write, but I think where I come down on the subject of dialogue is it should, I'm not big on writing like true, you know, dialogue that is exactly the way it would have sounded at the time. I mean, that, that sounds a little bit affected to me. So I think that I'm thrilled that the dialogue here sounded authentic to the time, but I try not, I try not to worry too much about that. (laughs) I just want it to sound like real people talking. This is a tough question, but if you could ask Grace Kelly, you know, uh, one question, if she was still with us, was there one sort of burning question that you had for her while, while you were writing this book and after you wrote this book that you would love to just find out? You know, I, I don't feel like I had, I mean, I had lots of questions that I would have loved for her to answer, but then if she had answered them, I wouldn't have been free to answer them myself. <laughs> um, but I think if I could ask her one question, it would be, if you could have played any one role in your life that you wished you could have played, which one was it? Mm. Um, you know, she was, she was in line to be in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Wow. Um, she was slated to, to play. I, I actually, I'm blanking on the name of the, the role. I think it might have been um, Stella. I can't, I can't remember. But the, 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 the play had to complete its Broadway run before they could make the movie. Mm-hmm. And by, by the time she got married, um, uh, it was still on Broadway. So she never got to be in that movie. So I wonder, I wonder if she wished she could have done that one um, or if there was another role that she just salivated over and she wished she could have played. Do you think she ever had, I mean, you deal with this a bit in the book, but do you think she ever had regrets about the decision she made to, to leave this incredible career that she was having at the age of 26? Um, well, so as you said, I mean, the book definitely goes into that in some detail, but I, you know, for sure, yes. And, but one thing I want to say about that is I think I mentioned this earlier in the interview, but I think it's worth saying again, you know, acting for Grace Kelly was a passion and a craft and an art. And it wasn't just something she did for fun. Yeah. Um, She trained for it. uh, She studied it. She was really deeply serious about it. And um, I think that would be hard for anyone to give up. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing decision that she made. And I can't imagine in this day and age her making that decision and what would have the, re- the repercussions. And It's hard to know. Yeah. Okay. I can't let you go without referencing a book that you mentioned in the beginning of this interview, Notes for the Young Writer, which was your first book. And since this is a show for writers, and I don't want, you know, I think they should all go out and buy it. But what were some of the most enduring or notes that, that you'd like to leave my listenership with people who are aspiring writers or thinking about or getting into writing, what's something that, that you'd like them to know? That the writing life is long Mm. and full of twists and turns and surprises. And to, as much as you can stay present with where it is for you at that time and be open to surprises and be open to trying different things, be open to, trying your hand at advertising writing, be open to trying teaching writing, be just be open um, and know that it's a long, it's a long road. Even, even if you find success early, it's still a long road. That's great advice. And, and, and honestly kind of echoes what happened in your career. You tried a lot of different things and you stuck with it. And now you've found this, this, this groove. Do you think you're going to stay with historical fiction or, or you might be open to another type of writing? I am always open to surprises, but right now I, I'm, actually, I'm just loving it. Yeah, you're in your sweet spot. So that's where, I, that's where I am. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'm, I'm excited to read your next book. Carrie Merritt, thank you so much for being on my podcast and best of luck to you. 
Thank you so much for having me, Jonathan. I really enjoyed talking to you. The book is The Girl in White Gloves. It's on Amazon and anywhere else you may find books. It's on my website. <laughs> I, uh, yes. You can find and a link to it. follow me on Instagram, Carrie Mara Writer. Thank you for listening to Write About Now, hosted by my dad, Jonathan Small. If you like what you hear, you can support the show by becoming a patron. All you have to do is log on to Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. Backslash right about now podcast and pledge as little as $5 a month to get all sorts of valuable information on how to be a better writer. You can also follow the show on Instagram and Facebook or check his website at writeaboutnowmedia.com. Thank you for listening and always remember to do the right thing. Thank you.